Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Unreason Report. This is going to be hopefully a weekly, maybe bi-weekly episode. Um, I'm not sure what to call it yet, maybe a podcast or a review. But the idea is basically that this will be a place where I review some of the most recent uh, events in the news cycle, whether that's in politics, sports, entertainment, cultural affairs and so on. And basically apply a critical thinking lens to these uh, events and maybe apply it to analysis as well. So the idea will be to deploy some of the skills that you can learn in my critical thinking course, which you can sign up for at the bottom of this video in the description, or maybe in one of the buttons at the top corner. I'm not sure which one. You'll learn there in that course about uh, all of the most important critical thinking skills. You'll learn about logical fallacies, cognitive biases, and learn how to construct uh, cogent arguments and how to conduct yourself well in intellectual, intellectual debates, in discourse. Basically, the idea of this uh, series, this Unreason Report, is to supplement that online course that you can sign up to with real-world applications in an ongoing way so that you're kind of kept informed about instances of unreason and irrationality in important events. So before I get into the content of today's episode, I just want to make a few disclaimers before we begin. Uh, first of all, I just want to make it clear that obviously I'm human, I'm going to make mistakes inevitably, but the idea of critical thinking is that you are honest and transparent about when you do make mistakes. So I'll strive as much as I can to be mindful of uh, errors that I might make in this episode and future episodes. I'll always read the comments, read the feedback, and I'll try to take them on board as much as I can. There's going to be inevitably uh, instances in which I get the facts wrong or in which the information, new information emerges, which contradicts what I'd previously assumed. And in those cases, I'll always try and uh, make an effort to, in subsequent episodes, to acknowledge that, to make it explicit and to admit when I've made errors. Another clarification at the outset is that I'm going to try as far as possible to strike a balance between the kinds of analyses that I perform in terms of uh, political coverage. So I don't want to give any undue attention to one end of the political spectrum, so to speak, whether it's left or right or in the centre or wherever it may be. I want to try to highlight through these episodes, through this Unreason report, that irrationality can affect everyone from any area on the political spectrum. Now, that's not to say that everything I'm going to be covering is necessarily going to be political. A lot of it will be, simply because I think that's where the stakes are highest in terms of poor critical thinking, errors, fallacies, cognitive biases, and so on. But I want to, as far as possible, um, cover the entire range in terms of the political spectrum of news stories and try to expose instances of irrationality, poor critical thinking from the left, from the right, and from the centre. Now, that's not always going to be possible, unfortunately. It might just happen to be the case that in any given day or week or in any um, recent news cycle, that it might be the case that there are more instances of critical thinking failures or poor reasoning or fallacies or cognitive biases on the left or on the right. It may be the case, I think historically this is true, that often you get certain areas of the political spectrum going through kind of convulsions of irrationality and unreason for whatever reason it might be, for cultural reasons, social reasons, political reasons, economic reasons. Certain areas of the political spectrum can become kind of co-opted or more um, prone to uh, convulsions of irration irrationality and unreason. And so it might be the case that during a given period, there just so happen to be more examples of poor critical thinking from one end of the political spectrum rather than another. Having said that, I'm always going to try to account for my own political biases, which I have and most people inv inevitably do have. So I have to always try to correct for those potential influences on my reasoning, on my analyses. And so I will strive as far as possible to correct for my own political prejudices and biases. It's not always going to be possible, probably, but... Uh, I will strive to do my best in that regard. And as I said, I will always try to get a good balance of stories or instances or examples of poor critical thinking from across the political spectrum. So this first instance of what I think is poor critical thinking and poor reasoning occurs somewhere where I um, actually have a lot of sympathy with the person in question. Dr. John Campbell has a YouTube channel which has become hugely popular over the last three years because of his coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. And compared to many other outlets, legacy media outlets and mainstream outlets, he's provided relatively, I would say, objective coverage of what's been going on in the pandemic. He tries to focus as much as he can on objective data, on the facts and figures, 
without becoming too beholden to ideological or political bias or persuasion. And so I think he has been, a, for the most part, a very good source of information. I also sympathise, just as a personal point, I do sympathise with some of his interpretations from a political perspective of what's been going on. I do sympathise with some of his objections to what's been going on in terms of things like, say, lockdowns and certain mandates that have been imposed or tried to be imposed during the pandemic. Notwithstanding that broad agreement, I think that recently, unfortunately, Dr. Campbell has actually demonstrated some failures in critical thinking, demonstrated some poor reasoning in relation to the issue of ongoing excess deaths. Now, it is a scandal, I agree with Dr. Campbell on this, it is actually, I think, a huge scandal that uh, mainstream news media are for the most part ignoring this ongoing issue, which is huge excess death numbers are still a factor. Obviously, in the first couple of years in the pandemic, we would expect to see large excess death numbers across most nations because of the pandemic, because of the virus, especially in the first year uh, pre-vaccination. Obviously, there was a huge number of excess deaths as a result of the virus. But as the vaccine came online, we would naturally have expected to see those excess deaths kind of going down. And as the economy restarted, as people got back out into the world and started becoming active again, and also taking into account the fact that a lot of the most vulnerable people, unfortunately, had been killed by the virus in the first two years of the pandemic, one would expect that the excess death numbers would start to go down. But unfortunately, that hasn't happened in 2022 and 2023. We've seen consistently high excess death numbers uh, across the board uh, internationally. And so John Campbell has drawn attention to this issue, and I think rightly so. Unfortunately, his interpretation of the likely or most plausible cause of these ongoing excess deaths, for me, is an instance of a failure in critical thinking on his part. And so what I want to do is to show you why I think this is uh, an instance of a failure in critical thinking and why he uh, engages in what's sometimes referred to as a non sequitur. Basically, that's a fancy way of, way of saying jumping to a conclusion. It's drawing or inferring a conclusion that is not supported or warranted by the evidence. It's a, a situation in which the conclusion does not necessarily follow from the evidence base. And so what I want to do is I'm going to share just a quick clip from one of Dr. Campbell's recent videos in which he's talking about the excess deaths. And he homes in on the rates of uh, lung disease. And from this, he draws what I think is a, a premature conclusion. In other words, he commits a, a non sequitur fallacy. So let's just have a quick look at this video, and then I'll talk a little bit about what he's saying and explain why this is an instance of a non sequitur fallacy. But where you'd expect to see uh, a lot more deaths, uh, lung disease, chronic respiratory disease, well, we're not. Slightly less deaths than normal. Some increase in 2022, but not, not a profound uh, increase where we would expect to see it, but we're not seeing it. This indicates to me that these causes of excess deaths, see, if it was COVID causing the excess deaths, we'd expect that to exacerbate lung diseases. <clears throat> and we're not seeing increasing deaths from lung diseases. So are we needing to look somewhere else other than COVID? Of course, is the question. Uh, this is um, other respiratory diseases. And <laughs> again, we see far fewer deaths than we would expect from other respiratory diseases. So again, <coughs> if we were seeing lots of COVID, <coughs> lots of COVID deaths would be, or COVID sequelae deaths from lung disease, we would expect this to be higher, but it's not, it's lower. People are not dying of these other lung diseases anything like as much as they normally do. So COVID lung infection as an explanation here basically is not holding water and we know this from other data that a lot of these excess deaths are not COVID deaths. Okay so you can see there that Dr Campbell is inferring from the fact that we have a very low incidence of lung disease in this case in the UK uh, in 2022 and it seems to be the same in 2023. He therefore concludes that we cannot attribute the ongoing excess deaths to COVID-19 because if COVID-19 was a cause of these excess deaths then we would be seeing higher rates and incidences of lung disease. Now, that for me is invalid reasoning based on certain other facts that we can obtain. If you look at several reputable peer-reviewed studies that have been released over the last couple of years, you can see, and I'll share these on the screen, you can see in these studies that COVID-19 is not just a disease of the lungs. It is also a cardiovascular disease. It's a cerebrovascular disease. In other words, it's a vascular disease in general, and it has very 
powerful damaging effects on these systems. So it goes beyond simply a disease that does damage to the lungs. Now, of course, it does do damage and has in the past done damage to the lungs. But what Dr. Campbell himself has previously pointed out, and what we need to take into account in this case, is the fact that, especially since the Omicron variant of the virus has emerged, we're seeing less and less lower lung disease from COVID-19. Increasingly, we're seeing that um, new cases of COVID-19 and the new variants of COVID-19 are manifesting in symptoms that are much more akin to your common cold, upper respiratory and head cold kind of symptoms. So sore throats, runny noses, sneezing, fever, fatigue, aches and pains and things like that. And less common or much less common now are lower respiratory manifestations and symptoms from COVID-19. So that would mean that we could still have a high incidence of COVID-19 over the last, say, two years, relatively speaking, We could still have that high incidence and also see low instances and low rates of lung disease. But it doesn't follow from that fact that it's not affecting the lungs anymore, that it couldn't also at the same time be causing other systemic issues. And again, the evidence that I'm sharing with you on the screen suggests that actually it could still be doing a huge amount of damage to the cardiovascular system, the cerebrovascular system, the vascular system in general, and indeed other systems within the human body. And all the evidence seems to suggest that actually COVID-19 is still causing those issues, notwithstanding the fact that it's no, no longer causing as many serious lower respiratory problems. And so given the fact that over the last three years, many more people have been infected with COVID-19 than there have been, for example, people who have received vaccination. That would suggest to me that the most plausible hypothesis in accounting for these ongoing excess deaths is COVID sequelae. In other words, uh, indirect and direct effects of uh, COVID uh, infection on other systems within the body, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, and so on. So one of the things with Dr. Campbell over the last few months, one of the patterns that I've noticed in a lot of his videos uh, is the fact that he at times insinuates or implies that one of the most likely or potential causes of these excess deaths are complications from the vaccines. Now, I sympathize with the fact that Dr. Campbell is limited to simply insinuating and implying these things because he can't actually come right out and say it on his YouTube channel because YouTube is very, still has quite stringent um, terms and conditions regarding what can and cannot be said about vaccines. And so he is limited and restricted to simply implying that the vaccines might be a cause of ongoing excess deaths. Um, My interpretation of Dr. Campbell's videos is that he believes that that is actually the most plausible hypothesis and that vaccines are causing most of those excess deaths. I disagree with that interpretation and that's not because I'm ideologically committed to vaccines or I think that vaccines have no issues or problems. I in fact find that uh, the vaccine mandates that were imposed in several countries or the push for vaccine mandates in certain countries was um, ethically illegitimate and politically illegitimate for various reasons. I also thought it was medically strange. I didn't understand the medical reasoning behind it. But in any case, I think that uh, notwithstanding that agreement, broad agreement on uh, scepticism about certain aspects of vaccination programs, it it can't be denied that the evidence base for COVID sequelae uh, causing many of these ongoing excess deaths is at least as strong as any evidence for the idea that uh, vaccination is, is, is the cause. And so it's unfortunate to see Dr. Campbell Uh, fall prey to this uh, non sequitur and this, I think, lapse in critical thinking. I fear that his increasing and growing scepticism about vaccines, which I can understand over the last six to eight months, paired with the fact that he's gotten a lot of positive reinforcement from his followers, from the comments in his YouTube videos, and he's seen by many as, uh, not without reason, uh, someone who's brave and standing up to the kind of most popular narratives about vaccination. Given that that's the case, I think he may have become increasingly dug in to the hypothesis that vaccination may be uh, the prime cause of ongoing excess deaths. And it may be the case that there's a little bit of confirmation bias going on. He's ignoring certain evidence, for example, the evidence about the nature of COVID-19 sequelae, 
the fact that COVID-19 sequelae are, are damaging the vascular system as a whole, the higher numbers of people who have been repeat infected or infected with COVID-19 compared to the rates of vaccination. Um, I think all of these things speak to the possibility that, unfortunately, Dr. Campbell, in this case at least, has been subjected to confirmation bias, maybe audience capture, and certainly in this instance he has, in my opinion, committed a non-sequitur fallacy. So it pains me to point this out as the first instance of poor critical thinking in this week's episode. I thought it was a fitting way to start, though, because it's partly because of the pandemic and the convulsion of irrationality and hysteria that I saw during the pandemic is part of what inspired me to create the Critical Thinking Project, to create my online course in critical thinking and to do these unreasoned reports weekly. Any small difference that I can make, I think, is uh, worth giving a shot. So um, that's why I started with this particular case, because I thought it was apt, given one of my main motivations for generating it this content and for starting the Critical Thinking Project. So again, uh, overall, big fan of Dr. Campbell's work. I commend him for everything that he's done over the last three years. This isn't meant to be a personal attack. This isn't an ad hominem attack. This is simply me uh, taking one of his claims and some of the assumptions around it, dissecting it and exposing why I think it is an instance of a failure in critical thinking and a, a non sequitur argument. Okay, so the next uh, instance of poor critical thinking is more broad, actually. Um, this applies to a whole kind of subculture within politics, which I hesitate to talk about because it's so contentious and so controversial. But it's just so constant, this failure in critical thinking and this particular set of fallacies are so prevalent within this particular subculture that I feel compelled to talk about it now. The reason I'm talking about it now is because I recently came across a channel called The Radical Centre. And this was set up by a woman named Leslie, I think, if I'm not mistaken, who had particularly bad experiences during a master's that she was pursuing in counselling, I believe. And she basically went public after she saw some disturbing patterns within that course in uh, Antioch University in, in the United States. And some of the evidence that she brought to bear and some of the things that she exposed, I thought were particularly shocking. But I think they were a testament to the fact that a lot of what is often called woke ideology, sometimes uh, it's referred to as identity politics. Uh, it has various names, obviously. The extent to which that has taken over, at least the university that she was studying in, and particularly the counseling course in that university, but her channel is very interesting as well because I think she does lots of interviews with other people and other students from other universities. And it really is a good demonstration of the fact that this, is, this isn't just some right-wing fantasy or some kind of scaremongering or bogeyman that ideological uh, capture has occurred in the universities by this kind of woke ideology, social justice ideology or identity politics ideology. Her channel is a perfect, I think, demonstration and proof that this is quite prevalent and should be taken seriously and that it's not just something made up by right-wing cranks or ideologues on the right who want to demonize the left or who want to straw man the left, for example. So it is worth uh, checking out this channel. I don't have any affiliation with the channel. This isn't me trying to gain some kind of reciprocal advantage. I do recommend that you just have a look at Leslie's YouTube channel, The Radical Centre, because it is just some compelling content and very interesting from a critical thinking point of view as well. So what I want to do is I want to focus on just this uh, one snippet from one of her videos. And I think that this snippet is a good segue into the issue of the Kafka trap fallacy as it manifests in this particular kind of ideology. And also talk a little bit about stacking the deck and closed systems. And I'll explain uh, shortly what I mean by those uh, terms. There were a couple of a couple of times in grad school where I started questioning it. I had mentioned a few of those instances. There was another time. Um, I can't remember what the shooting was because unfortunately in this country there are many. Um, but there was uh, there was basically like for lack of a better term a healing circle uh, for people to discuss a police shooting. And I went. Um, I felt like I needed to go because I was afraid that there wouldn't be very many white people there. And if there aren't very many white people there, what does that say? And so I wanted to be a good white person. Okay. Um, and also I, I knew some of these people who were, who were troubled by this. And it is, you know, it is troubling when you see, when you see interactions that 
go wrong and people die. Uh Um, And I remember having been, having been taught that you should listen to, you should listen to people of color, just be quiet and listen. Okay. Okay. Just be quiet and listen. And um, during that circle, one of the doctoral students in my program made made a comment about like, you know, I see white people in here and they're really quiet and I don't know why that is. Hmm. And I thought, this is, this yeah. is being put in a position where you can't, right, you cannot make a good choice here. Right. And a white woman started to speak and then she started to cry. And I was so anxious because I thought, oh no, it's white women's tears. Yeah. You're not supposed to do that. Right. This is wrong. Yeah. Um, and I just remembered feeling really unsettled. And so there were like chips, there were these chips that happened. Okay, so I thought that was an interesting case because I'd heard of instances like that before myself, um, but it was just interesting to see it confirmed that this actually was happening in a, in a particular university program. But I thought it was a perfect uh, demonstration of um, how the Kafka trap fallacy can work in practice. Now. Another video that Leslie did on her channel, she shared her screen where you could see um, an element from the online platform that she used in her university, in Antioch University, and there were certain resources. And in one of these sections, you can see here on the screen, there's what's called the covert white supremacy pyramid on the right-hand side. There's this kind of column. And the idea, I guess, here is that these are behaviors or things that people say, which are examples of white supremacy in action. On the left, then, there's this list of books recommended reading related to white supremacy and anti-racism. Importantly, as you can see here, White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo is listed. And I think White Fragility as a concept, but also the book as well, is a perfect illustration of the Kafka trap fallacy in action. But there are certain um, features here on the right which jumped out at me. This, I think, is a really good synopsis of the ways in which this particular kind of subculture of social justice activism and social justice theory uses Kafka traps in order to insulate it from any possible criticism. So I just want you to take notice, first of all, of the following two alleged features of white supremacy, which are actually, I think, contradictory, but which reveal the way in which this kind of perspective insulates itself from any possible criticism. So you can see here one alleged feature of covert white supremacy is white silence, which basically means the silence of white people in the face of ongoing injustices perpetrated against minority communities, whether that be black people or Asian people or whoever it may be. So when a white person doesn't say anything or doesn't go out in the street protesting or join in activism against that kind of injustice, that allegedly is an instance or an example of white supremacy. But you'll notice just pretty shortly following on from that, they have another feature of alleged white supremacy, which is the white savior complex. And the idea here basically is that it's problematic when white people assume the ability or the capacity to engage in political action or activism on behalf of marginalized communities in the face of perceived injustices. So you see the tension here. It seems as if no matter what a white person does, essentially, it can be interpreted as an instance of white supremacy and therefore racism. Because if I try to speak up and speak out against perceived injustices against marginalized communities, that can be simply conceived or interpreted as white savior complex. Whereas if I don't do that, then that can be perceived and interpreted as white silence. So in either case, I'm committing an act which is allegedly an instance of white supremacy and racism. So that just gives you an example of how it's virtually impossible to avoid being accused of white supremacy if you are a white person under this perspective, under this ideology. But further down, I wanted to focus on another very important alleged feature of white supremacy, which is this one here, denial of white privilege. This, for me, is a perfect encapsulation of the Kafka trap rhetorical strategy that is so often deployed by this particular subculture of social justice and woke ideology. The idea basically is that any person who is white who rejects or denies or tries to speak against the accusation that they are beneficiaries of white privilege or that they are indeed suffering from white supremacy or racism, anyone who objects, their objection is taken as proof that they are indeed guilty of the accusation. This is a perfect way to insulate the ideology and the perspective from criticism, since any criticism coming from the outside, that is to say from a white person, any objection 
raised by a white person can immediately be construed as just more proof of their white supremacy, of their white privilege, of their problematic racism. Even if that racism is being denied by the white person, it can just be construed as them being in denial. They're simply fragile about their repressed inner racism. They can't confront it, they can't recognize it. And therefore their objection is just a manifestation of that psychological denial of that repression. This kind of approach, this Kafka trap, is endemic in uh, social justice circles and woke ideology. And what essentially it does is it makes the ideology unfalsifiable. And the reason is because even if, for example, a minority speaks out against this ideology, say if a black person speaks out against it or questions it or says not all white people suffer from white privilege or white supremacy or anti-black racism or whatever it is, that in turn is usually perceived as internalized racism. So this is the perfect Kafka trap. It essentially makes this an unfalsifiable doctrine. Another term for this is a closed system. So when a theory or when a hypothesis or a set of hypotheses are unfalsifiable, we sometimes refer to that as a closed system. It cannot be penetrated by criticism. It cannot be shown to be false. Now, the important thing to note here is that in the case of social justice theory and woke ideology, it's not that it is unfalsifiable in the sense that it cannot specify conditions under which it could be proven false. So, for example, it could easily be said that you know a society in which there's zero racism and zero prejudice and which everyone is perfect equal, that would be an instance in which it would no longer be true. This social justice perspective would no longer obtain. It would have been rendered obsolete by perfect justice being realized in the world. So it's not unfalsifiable in that sense. The way in which it's unfalsifiable is it's methodologically unfalsifiable. So in other words, it means that anyone who attempts or even begins to attempt to criticize or bring countervailing evidence, they can just immediately be preempted through this methodological move, the Kafka trap. So it formally insulates the ideology from being falsified. So the reason I wanted to show you this case and to highlight the prevalence of the Kafka trap rhetorical move, uh, the Kafka trap fallacy, is because I think that a lot of people get trapped by this. And there's a reason it's called the Kafka trap. It's because it is a trap. It's a way of ensnaring you into a position where you feel like you have no option but to concede. You're going to be accused if you stay silent, you're going to be accused if you object, and there's no other option left to you, it seems. If you're aware of this ploy and you have a name for it, you can actually more effectively resist this. If you draw attention to the fact that you see what the person is doing and you can call them out for doing it, if you can say, when they, for example, say that your denial is just simply more proof of your white fragility, it's more proof of your white privilege, your white supremacy, when they make that kind of uh, rhetorical move, the Kafka trap, you can simply point it out. You actually have the tools, as you're familiar with critical thinking, to say what you've just done is what's called a Kafka trap fallacy. Here's the reason why it's fallacious. Now can we actually talk about the content of my objection rather than the fact that I've objected? It's not necessarily always going to work, but I think that it would actually throw a lot of these people off who deploy this kind of rhetorical move because they think they can get away with it because people don't really know generally how to respond to it. They don't even know what's happening most of the time. They're not aware of the fact that this pattern is being deployed, this trap is being deployed. Whereas if you actually call them out on it and you make them aware of the fact that you know exactly what they're doing and you have a name for it and you can concisely explain it and express it to them, that's probably going to put them down on the back foot and often they won't really know how to respond because they won't have come across this before. They won't have actually heard someone call them out in this way before. And that opens the door a little bit then to the possibility of actually having a more honest discussion about the actual content of your objection, explaining why, for example, you might feel that you are not inherently racist or that you are not necessarily privileged because of your whiteness or that you're not necessarily a white supremacist and so on and so forth. And if you can get into the content of your objection rather than allowing them to distract with the fact of your objection itself, you stand a better chance of resisting this kind of ploy. You stand a better chance of opening up genuine dialogue and getting to the content of the arguments rather than the fact of your objection itself being somehow proof of your guilt. Okay, the final case of Poor critical thinking, poor reasoning in the news cycle that I wanted to focus on today it pertains to the issue of vaping or e-cigarettes as they're sometimes called. And in this particular instance, I'm seeing the Nirvana fallacy rear its ugly head. So the Nirvana fallacy is covered in the critical thinking project course. Again, if you want to check that out, link in the description below. So we talk about the Nirvana fallacy there. 
but I think um, it's particularly common in this particular issue for some reason, in the issue of vaping. And so I wanted to just focus on this. There's a news item that came up recently uh, on the BBC, and I wanted to share this story with you, so you should be able to see it on the screen. I wanted to focus in here on a particular passage from this story. It says here, earlier this week, nine directors of public health operating in Cheshire and Merseyside called for a countrywide ban on sales of disposable vapes. They said the rapid rise in vaping was alarming and the vapes may have unidentified ingredients that could be harmful. Uh, the government previously said it was taking bold action to crack down on youth vaping. So there's a few things that I just want to disentangle and clarify here first. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that I think that it's probably a bad idea for young people to just start vaping. I don't think vaping is necessarily an inherently good thing to do. I think it is plausible that there might be some adverse health effects. People can become addicted. So I don't deny any of that. And I think that it's reasonable for a government, for example, to engage in messaging campaigns, for example, to try to reduce the rates of uptake of vaping amongst young people who don't already smoke. So I think that's a reasonable concern. However, this kind of fear-mongering or worry-mongering about vaping as an inherently bad thing to do, all things considered, I think is actually a form of the Nirvana fallacy in action. So the idea basically is that we should look at the different alternatives and compare what are the net benefits of the different alternatives in terms of policy and indeed individual actions. So when it comes to vaping, the relative point of comparison is cigarettes. So we want to know what the relative harms and benefits of vaping are versus smoking cigarettes, because those are the alternatives that a lot of people face in terms of comparable behaviours. And we also want to look at how helpful vaping is at actually allowing people to give up on cigarettes if cigarettes turn out to be more harmful. The evidence is already in on this. Vaping has been shown to be much less harmful than smoking cigarettes. So smoking e-cigarettes, e the same number of e-cigarettes, holding other things equal, is much less bad for your health than cigarettes are. And vaping has also been shown, demonstrated quite effectively, uh, quite um, comprehensively. E-cigarettes and vaping help people to give up smoking cigarettes. And so they're a good thing in that sense. So what we should be doing and what a common sense policy would be for vaping and for e-cigarettes is that we should be encouraging the sale of and allowing the sale of vaping devices and e-cigarettes. We should be allowing that to happen because people who want to give up smoking can use them as a very effective path towards giving up cigarettes permanently and improving their health as a result. Even if vaping still causes some other residual damage, overall it causes less damage. So you're swapping one bad thing for a much less bad thing. It doesn't mean that it's perfect, it just means that it's less bad. The other thing then is, of course, the argument is that some young people, especially for them, it is a gateway into smoking cigarettes later in their life. So they start with vaping because they think it's not too harmful. Maybe it has some kind of social cachet among their peers. And then from there, they become addicted to cigarettes later on. The evidence, from what I can gather, is pretty low or I should say that there is evidence that this doesn't happen very frequently, that vaping is not a very prevalent gateway, quote-unquote, drug into smoking uh, cigarettes. So again, it's not a prevalent problem. Sometimes it happens, but it's not a prevalent problem. Again, also, some people might become addicted to e-cigarettes and to vaping, and some young people might become addicted to e-cigarettes and vaping, but again, the rates are very low. So when you take into account the low rates of addiction to e-cigarettes, the low rates of e-cigarettes being a gateway into traditional cigarettes. You take into account the benefits of e-cigarettes in terms of allowing people who already smoke to effectively give up smoking. And you compare the absolute harms of e-cigarettes with the absolute harms of uh, smoking traditional cigarettes. All in all, it very strongly commends a policy that allows for the sale of e-cigarettes Allowing for also, of course, messaging from the government about the potential risks of vaping, the, the clarification that one should not simply start vaping if they don't already smoke cigarettes, and with all the, the course qualifications about potential harmful products or ingredients within e-cigarettes, and try to regulate as best as possible so that products, these products, these e-cigarettes, have as few harmful ingredients in them as possible, but still allow for the sale of e-cigarettes. So 
the desire to ban and the call to ban e-cigarettes and vaping for me is a perfect manifestation of the Nirvana fallacy. So the Nirvana fallacy basically is when you compare alternative courses of action with some ideal scenario or some ideal outcome that is essentially unrealizable in the real world. Sometimes the phrase, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good is used. And I think that's a decent synopsis of the Nirvana fallacy. It's basically saying, look, if you can get a better set of circumstances, if you can achieve better outcomes, don't let the fact that those outcomes aren't perfect prevent you from pursuing those better outcomes and that better alternative, even if that better alternative still has some harms involved and potential risks. So that's what's happening here when it comes to vaping. It seems to me that a lot of people submit to the Nirvana fallacy when they're thinking about how government should deploy policy in this particular context. They think that because e-cigarettes and vaping cause some harms and you can see certain sad stories about young teenagers becoming addicted to, addicted to e-cigarettes, that because there are bad outcomes, therefore we should ban it. But the relevant question is, compared to what? Compared to what alternative? And if the alternative is that these young people are more likely to take up traditional cigarettes, if you get rid of vaping, then obviously allowing vaping to continue is the preferable alternative, even if it's not perfect. And so we should always be mindful of the fact that when we're talking about the real world, and especially when we're talking about policies, governmental policies, we should be comparing one government policy with the available alternatives that we have before us and the realistic outcomes of those various alternatives. We should not be allowing ourselves to think of some utopian, idealistic path which doesn't exist in the real world and which for all intents and purposes can't exist in the real world and comparing all of our policy alternatives to that perfect outcome and thinking to ourselves, well, the fact that they all fall short of that perfect outcome and that perfect scenario means that we should reject all of these policies or we should ban all of these products or ban these behaviours which cause certain bad outcomes. So we should be very mindful of the Nirvana fallacy because it can lead us down a path where we end up rejecting policies that could actually make things a whole lot better for a large number of people compared to the status quo or compared to other policy alternatives. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel by clicking the subscribe button below this video and also the little notification bell to ensure that you are notified anytime some new content is uploaded to the channel. Also hitting that like button will really help me reach more people. It will help my videos appear in more search results. So that would be great. If you like what I'm doing as well, you can support me by becoming a Patreon if you go to the Patreon page, which again is linked in the description below. And if you become the middle tier member, you will gain access immediately to the Critical Thinking Toolkit, which is the online course which goes through all of the most common fallacies, cognitive biases, and basically just teaches you how to become a better thinker in all walks of life and how to avoid error and argue more effectively. You can also, if you prefer not to become a subscriber and not to pay a monthly fee, you can donate a discrete amount of money by going to my page on the website buymeacoffee.com. Again, the link is in the description below. That's a nice way of just saying thank you to creators that you like if you want to just make one discrete one-off donation. So again, I would really appreciate your support there as well. So thank you very much and I'll see you in the next video.